Thank you for your patience, everyone. Screen, I'm going to be very brief. Lots of screen pleasures to uh, present to you, uh, Dr. Wayne Brown. Uh, he's been a tremendous colleague. This marks my uh, 24 months uh, here at Richmond Care. And the work that Dr. Wayne Brown has done at the CPR, other efforts within the bank, has simply been remarkable. And uh, without further delay, Thank you, Eric. Um, so once again, it's a pleasure to talk to, uh, talk to uh, this group. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to bring on everybody from, from the CTR. If, you can, if, if uh, uh, I'll be covering some of the same ground at the, at the CTR annual, at annual meeting, although the focus will be a little bit different. So if this doesn't work out, I don't know if you're even hearing me right now. Are they hearing me? They don't even know if they're hearing me. Uh, um, you'll have uh, other opportunities. Um, so I wanted to talk particularly about uh, about comparative effectiveness and, and uh, big data, um, <clears throat> and really to show our, our capabilities. Um, because as our great colleague Sue Gray John uh, said to me the, the the other day, we're really capable of, of anything uh, analytically at, at, at this point. And these are some <clears throat> some pretty complicated um, data analyses, but once presented, once understood, it's actually very simple to present. And to under, understand the material, and that's always our goal that we can present uh, and bring forward complicated data sets, complicated ideas, structure in a, in a, in a way that makes it highly uh, available to to uh, clinical audiences and allows us to make good um, decisions. Okay, so now tell what I'm. All right, <clears throat> so I can just advance it with uh, with this guy. Left click is advance and. Um, all right, well, we'll just, we'll see what happens. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay. Um, the scroller is much too sensitive. <laughs> and I've had this problem before. I have to have Eric back up because he knows how to, how to deal with the, with, the, with the mouse. Okay. So do we need comparative effectiveness to improve uh, quality? And what's this all about? We've been comparing diagnostic and therapeutic strategies for uh, decades. Uh, however, uh, randomized <laughs> trials don't really meet all of our societal needs. And why is that? Most randomized trials, the vast majority of randomized trials, are conducted for registration purposes, for new pharmaceuticals, or new devices for the, uh, the FDA. And so the kinds of questions that we come up with all the time concerning therapeutic and diagnostic strategies that are of a great societal uh, interest uh, may not have been adequately addressed. So there's, there's gaps in our in, in in our knowledge base that we that we really need to uh, address, and that's why you've heard over the last year, so much last several years, so much concern uh, about comparative effectiveness. Um, so what kind of studies do, do uh, uh, we, we have that allow us to, to uh, uh, address issues in comparative effectiveness? Well, of course, the gold standard remains randomized um, uh, controlled trials. But then there are observational studies, they can come from clinical databases or administrative databases or a mix between them, as I'm going to show you uh, today. And then within each of these, you can have cohort studies in which we group, get a group of patients together and follow them forward and look at outcomes. Or case control studies, in which you start out working backwards. You take people who have some kind of outcome and people who don't, and then you look back uh, at, at, um, uh, at um, uh, risk factors. There are other kinds of studies, entirely systematic reviews and, and analysis of simulations and qualitative uh, uh, research. Except for qualitative research and simulations, I'll show you pretty much of uh, everything. All right, so one of the advantages of randomized trials is really only one, that this is the only method that can overcome treatment selection bias. You'd say, well, is it worth it? Is it worth it with all the great expense of randomized trials and all the time it, 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 it takes just to overcome this one little thing called treatment selection bias? Well. There are many clinical trialists who believe that observational studies are completely worthless, and we should only do randomized trials because treatment selection bias is so great that we can never that we can never um, uh, over, overcome it. 
So it's a debate that goes on and on and on uh, without without um, uh, resolution. And we'll address a little bit more of that, and you'll see as we, as we go through some of these. <clears throat> we accomplish certain things, very real things, with non-randomized approaches, um, uh, however, because the disadvantages of randomized trials, they lack generalizability, and I'll also show you graphically how that can work. They're very expensive, they've become outdated, they are crossovers, there's non-blinding of studies, you'd really like them when they're blinded, but the strategy studies, usually you cannot um, uh, blind them. There's limited power to look at subgroups, even with really big mega trials, there's often very limited power to look at, at uh, subgroups. And then you have problems to finding the uh, groups to be com uh, compared. Well, you have that in anything, but you think, well, I want to compare this group to that group. So I'll just give you an example. We actually were part of, a, of an NIH grant here to uh, look at the use of genetics and picking uh, antiplatelet agents, P2Y12 uh, agents. Um, and uh, we spent two years on, uh, on the uh, um, uh, strategy group for the, the, the trial, trying to figure out what the design was, never could figure it out. Finally, we had to, had to abandon the trial. So it's not only straightforward just to find what you, what you want, want to study. So asking a good question is always the most important of, of thing. So let's look at generalizability a, a little bit. Uh, so um, I do not have a pointer on this, do I? Yeah. No. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, the problem of, of, uh, of uh, generalizability. If you want to look at your population distribution and really understand outcomes in, in uh, uh, this, this population, um, how do you do it? Now, the whole principle that we use in, in, uh, um, in doing research is we sample. We don't look at the entire population. That's in principle what a presidential election is, where you're looking at every, everybody. But we don't do that. We sample. And so how do you draw a sample that will allow you to look at the whole population? You know, in a randomized trial, you look at, if you draw from, from uh, sample one, Sample, sample one may tell you a lot about uh, the mean, but it doesn't tell you much about this subgroup that's in, that, that's in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in gray. But what happens if you uh, draw a sample, sample two? You can't say much about the mean. You can't say anything at all about the, the, the group is in, in, in gray. They would say, well, you'd never do that. We're not going to draw a sample like that. But if people don't like the result of your randomized trial, they will accuse you of it anyway. They'll say, You're, you wanted to look at, at this group, but you got, you got, you got that, that, that group. To get at that better with, with observational studies, then we should really have a more realistic ability to go widely and look at, at the, uh, the full spectrum of your population, including ability to look at a, sub, uh, a subgroup of, of uh, interest. So <clears throat> there are advantages and, and disadvantages of registering and administering data for comparative effectiveness. The, what you get out of observational studies is you have very large sample sizes, ability to look at, at, sub, uh, at subgroups, you have real world patients, much more contemporary uh, data. But there are disadvantages, treatment selection bias, as we, as we discussed, data quality and observational studies. You, in principle, you could set up an observational study just like a randomized trial, collect data with the same integrity, but in, in practice, people generally don't, don't do so. You're dealing with, with data quality issues. Not to get to how Outcomes in randomized uh, trials, the ones we're really most interested in, you're going to uh, <laughs> adjudicate uh, by a, 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 a committee. That virtually never happens in observational studies. And when they're really big, it's not practical. Uncertain definitions of, 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 the, of the treatment groups. This goes on especially in, in pharmaceutical observational uh, studies in which the exposure period may be very uncertain. And people are endlessly arguing about whether you have an adequate exposure to one pharmaceutical versus, versus the one that you're trying to <coughs> uh, compare to. Um, and then the covariate and outcomes data of, of uh, interest may not be available. And this is really much more of a problem of the covariance uh, in observational studies than in randomized trials, because in principle, in randomized trials, you can make your groups look exactly uh, 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 the, the same. That's what randomized trials do. By overcoming treatment selection bias, 
your your the, the descriptors of your two groups should be uh, should be the the, uh, the the same. The larger the randomized trial, the closer the testimony can come to being being true. But but uh, the covariates are really very important uh, in observational studies because you use the, the characteristics of the patients of the study to correct for differences uh, between the, the groups. And then the outcomes, and the things you're most interested in are very often not, not, not available. So what do you do? So we have this problem with these large national da databases, um, such as the National the Cardiovascular Data Registry, the SDS database, that the actual outcomes data you want are not available. And so you have to figure out how you're going to handle that. And we'll, I'll have quite a bit of uh, information about that and the kinds of approaches that, that people are, are uh, taking. <clears throat> um, Okay, so now here I'm just comparing uh, administrative data and uh, uh, registry uh, 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 data. <clears throat> um, administrative data are readily available, while reg registry data require prospective co uh, collection. So in principle, you like registry data, it's, cl it's clinical data, but it takes a lot more work to, to uh, get it, to, to, to put it together, they're much more expensive. Uh, anal uh, analysis of administrative data are relatively uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, inexpensive and it's e relatively easy within administrative data actually to have long-term outcomes. But the disadvantages to administrative data is, uh, uh, as well. You lack clinical uh, description and may lack critical uh, variables. And generally, if you have problems with quality of data in registries, the quality of data in administrative databases is, um, uh, is, is even worse. Now let's move on to, to the kinds of approaches that people uh, take to overcome treatment of um, select, selection uh, bias. And that's a theme that will sort of run throughout as I, as I uh, go through uh, examples. The first thing that people have tried, tried to do when looking at observational data is to have very rigorously defined, defined groups. Well, that's all very nice, uh, but then you're really very limited in, to the, pa the patients that you're going to uh, look, look at. And then there's sort of uh, standard multivariate analysis, such as logistic regression and Cox model, in which you use statistical approaches to try and, uh, um, uh, and account for differences in the covariate data between your, your um, uh, patients. So it's a method statistically of overcoming uh, uh, treatment of, of selection bias. That's sort of been overcome or, or replaced today in many of these studies by a propensity score analysis. And there, the propensity score uh, is and compare if you compare one form of treatment and, and another, you create a model to see the propensity for one treatment compared to the other. And you know, I'll show you examples of, uh, of, of that and become more clear as I, as, as I work through this. Um, and the, most of the propensity scores you, you use a, a statistical approach called logistic um, regression. And then how do you use it if you've got this propensity? One is to define subgroups by the, the uh, uh, propensity um, uh, score. It's a fairly common uh, approach. Another is just to use it as a covariate in the multivariate analysis. Well, I've always thought that that didn't make much sense because if you got the covariate da data, it doesn't make much sense to form another score that will replace it the, uh, uh, the covariates. It doesn't add any, uh, any, any information. So I've never been much of a, uh, of a fan of it. And then they're matched groups by propensity. That's historically, or at least for the last number of years, in the most common uh, uh, approach. You'll see many papers in literature. And, and uh, it really looks nice, because when you do that, it looks like you've got randomized trials. You have the same number of patients in both groups, or sometimes two to one, but you have, and, and then all of the covariates look exactly the, uh, the, the same. <clears throat> um, to some extent, that's been replaced by inverse probability weighting. Now, the advantage of inverse probability weighting, it's a statistical approach that allows you to take two groups and essentially line them up so they look, uh, they, 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 uh, uh, look the same. And the advantage of, of inverse probability uh, uh, weighting um, is that you don't lose uh, any of your patients. You can keep all your patients. Now, you may say, well, that's all very nice, but you have one group over here and one group over, over there. Maybe the outliers from both groups don't belong in this analysis, but you can you can trim it as well, so you can overcome that that particular uh, uh, problem. I have to say, with all of these methods, I'm unconvinced that any of them add anything to simple, simple multivariate uh, an, an analysis. So they look great; they really look great. Um, but do they overcome treatment selection bias? And 
And they really don't in the end of the day because you can only correct for what? You can only correct for the things you measure. You can't correct for the things that you don't, you don't measure. Now, what people have tried to do to get away from that is use what's called an instrumental variable. So it's a different kind of approach to overcoming treatment selection bias. So an instrumental variable is a variable that cleanly separates your, your uh, group but does not pr uh, predict the um, uh, out outcome. <clears throat> uh, economists really like instrumental variables. You'll find biostatisticians and, and epidemiologists don't do this very much. There is one that works, one instrumental variable that does work. Who can tell me what that is? No, good, good guess, often used. But <clears throat> who's to say that because you have different geographic location that it, that it over overcomes all the differences in your covariates? <clears throat> Randomization. Randomization is an instrumental variable. Cleanly separates your groups, and by itself, randomization by itself does not, not um, uh, predict the outcome. Uh, to my, my mind, as, a, as, a, as an epidemiologist, who gets the, you know what epidemiologists do? They, they, they criticize every, everyone else's methods. As an epidemiologist, I can say that uh, uh, randomization is the only one that works. Okay, so pharmacologic versus uh, strategies trials. When do, we, when do we use observational studies? When do we use uh, randomization? Strategy RCTs such as PCI versus cabbage, cabbage versus medicine, PCI versus medicine. They suffer from, uh, from crossover, small sample size, line of design, and the, the data become obsolete. That creates a place for registry studies and comparative effectiveness using non-randomized data. On the other hand, uh, uh, pharmacological uh, RCTs have limited crossover, large sample, sample sizes, blind design with problem with, with uh, uh, obsolescence. And the other problem that, that, that and the problem you have with Registries look at pharmaceuticals, as I said, is you have problems defining exposure because people are on and off, 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 off the drug. So there's been less of a place, in, in my mind, for um, <clears throat> comparative effectiveness studies using observational da data to look at uh, pharmaceuticals. However, there really is a place for, for very large data sets to look at safety, including safety of, 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 of uh, ph pharmaceuticals. There's many, many studies in pharmacoepidemiology just that uh, uh, subject. The great source of data for all these kinds of studies are these national registries, the STS uh, and, and uh, uh, the NCDR. The NCDR was formed in, in the 1990s, and now it's going to uh, have a half a dozen or so of uh, registries, and we participate in almost all of them uh, here. And uh, there, there, are, there are now hundreds of papers that have come out of these, uh, these registries. So 2,000 hospitals, um, uh, 16 plus some uh, million million records. It's a large uh, uh, database. The CAF PCI, which we'll show you data from CAF PCI, largely has 15 million uh, plus uh, uh, records, and now has a penetration of, of, of over 90 percent of the CAF labs. I don't know exactly, 95 percent, something like that, of the CAF labs in in the country participate in in um, uh, the NCDR. So that really solves the problem of generalizability. It's essentially everybody. Same with the SDS, the thoracic surgeons for, for the cabbage database, virtually 100% penetration. And some are absolutely 100% uh, penetration. So the ICD registry is a mandated registry. That's 100% uh, penetration. For the, for, um, uh, uh, the TAVR program, percutaneous uh, aortic valve re re replacement, uh, uh, that's a mandated registry. It has 100% of uh, penetration. And you'll be seeing some very interesting comparative effectiveness studies coming out of that as well over the next couple of years. So uh, this is one of my uh, favorite comparative effectiveness uh, 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 studies uh, done with, with uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, in, in, in CDR. And what we did with this is uh, just 59 institutions, not that big, 14,000 uh, uh, patients, and we collected some prospective data on use of, of uh, closure uh, de devices after cardiac uh, cath catheter catheterization. <laughs> so we didn't just use the registry, we had to collect additional data as well, but not really a lot, it was non-randomized. Non and we didn't do such fancy 
statistics. So very simple multivariate uh, 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 analysis. I know. Uh, and the most serious of uh, uh, was was uh, uh, bleeding, and one of the devices, the basal seal, was uh, demonstrated to have a high risk there of uh, the odds ratio of uh, <coughs> uh, greater than two. Look at this. Now, so these closure devices. Oh, it's pretty. Look at your measurements. Here's what I want to point out. One of the things when you put a study up that's, that you're in the middle of um, a research study, yeah. you never want to give all your information about how you do it. Okay. <laughs> Generally, even when okay. you talk to them. So for these closure yeah. devices, there's not such oh, great treatment that. selection bias. I mean, why would one use one closure device versus, versus another? And so here, um, the treatment selection bias that you have in non-randomized studies is not felt to be such a big problem, and the basis deal was off, off the market very rapidly after, after the publication of this study. This is comparative effectiveness really done right. We served a societal need with, with, with this without having to, to mount a massive randomized trial. Now, the other thing about closure devices is they were approved by the FDA based on efficacy alone with just a couple of hundred patients, but you can't get at safety. With a couple of hundred patients, but you could with we could with fifteen uh, thousand, which allowed us to make it. Well, I think was really a, a, a very good science. Here's just a little bit more data on, on from the study. I won't go into it. Here's another uh, stu study, somewhat larger in, in, in scope, also from uh, the the uh, uh, in CDR, uh, uh, comparing bare metal and and uh, drug eluding stents. So it's uh, led by my, by uh, Pam Douglas from, from uh, uh, Duke. Uh, and um, what's interesting about uh, this study, this was the, the first comparative effectiveness study done with these uh, databases in which the NCDR was linked to administrative databases, was linked to Medicare database to allow us to look at, at, um, uh, at outcomes. So here's the, here are the data. Um, this is a huge study. Drug and living sense, uh, 218,000 people, bare metal sense, 45,000 people. Uh, and to bring these into alignment, they, they used inverse probability weighting. So that takes, we get to use all the patients and essentially bring them into alignment so they look the same. So you, on the, the, the left, you see the unadjusted analysis, on the right, the IPW adjusted uh, an analysis. And there were small differences between the groups, like for age, there's a little bit of a, of a difference here. And essentially, it went away with the adjustment. That's what IPW does. It essentially makes the, the, the groups uh, look, look the same. So that's all very nice. What did they find? So uh, here, are the, here are the results, 30-month 30, 30, uh, 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 event rates. And they found that there was a mortality advantage with uh, bare metal stents. Uh, and uh, but no difference in between vascularization within the groups. Opposite of, opposite of clinical trials. You know, any good clinician that looks at this, you know, first clinician that looks at this and says, I don't believe this. Is this right? So uh, what, how does this compare with, with uh, the clinical trials? So here we go. Here's a meta-analysis of, of uh, 21 clinical trials comparing drug eluding and, and uh, uh, bare metal sense, looking at mortality, no mortality, which is what you what. So so <clears throat> if there take if there's a takeaway, there's one takeaway from the day well, that's very important to us as we go forward. We consider developing these kinds of studies at at uh, uh, Christiana and and across our our partner institutions in, in uh, uh, the CTR. Size does not overcome bias. So I'll say that one again. Size does not over, overcome bias. And so what are you going to believe? And so at the end of the day, when they're, when they're going in opposite directions, the randomized trials, even though it's a much smaller number of patients, 9,000 versus, versus 300,000, randomized tri trials will trump uh, the, uh, the observational data. Well, it didn't deter us, of course. So we went ahead with, with uh, uh, a cert. So I know Zugwe, and I missed it last week because I, I was out. Zugwe, uh, or the week before, Zugwe presented uh, interesting data on, on a cert, probably pretty, pretty technical. Um, this one would have been better have this one first than his after, but okay, you know, it is what it is. Uh, and so this is going to be a much less technical presentation. They'll cover some, but not all, all, all of the same ground. 
So this is the final results of, of uh, the research study. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, was uh, supported uh, by a grant opportunity grant from uh, the National Inst Institutes of, of uh, Health. Um, and here we, because we're comparing PCI and cabbage, we used two, both of the big databases. We use the NCDR database and we use the SDS uh, database and had <clears throat> um, 600 sites. So in clinical trials, to go to the national meetings, you see the clinical trials, they're very proud to put up pictures of all, of all their sites with 50 or 100 sites or something. Well, none of them have maps that look like this. <laughs> 600 with 600 sites. So, okay, so our purpose initially was to compare long-term mortality of, of cabbage and percutaneous coronary intervention in patients with, with stable ischemic heart disease. Uh, we link both of the databases to the CMS 100% uh, uh, denominator file, so we link both of them to, to uh, MedFAR, and then we look at the propensity for cabbage using logistic uh, uh, regression, and then we brought the groups in to balance using the inverse probability, but then we used all the other methods uh, as well. Uh, and then we did sensitivity analysis, which I'll, 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 I'll explain when we get to it. So this is just a concert di diagram of how we get to our study population. And here's the propensity for cabbage. And this is, you're beginning to see this kind of figure more and more. And really everybody that do does propensity analysis should have a figure something like this, in which you look at the propensity for for cabbage and the uh, and, uh, in, in both the PCI group in green and the cabbage group. This is the propensity for cabbage. They have a much higher propensity based on the covariance for cabbage in the group that actually got cabbage than the group that got uh, PCI. You look at the same. We can't compare those. Those groups are so very different, we can't possibly uh, compare them. That's one view. The other group is, wow, you really defined the differences between the people who got cabbage and the people who got PCI, so you accounted for all the differences, therefore all you have to do is correct for that statistically and you compare them. So, you know, you decide. Here, here are the uh, baseline data, uh, unadjusted and IPW uh, uh, adjusted, and there were uh, at least statistically significant uh, differences between uh, the, the, the groups. Um, uh, before correction, it largely went away uh, after correction. Of course, you can have very small differences between between groups and still have them be statistically significant. So, 73.1 versus 74.5 in, in, in age, uh, highly statistically significant. So the p-values here, they don't mean a thing. Because when the groups are so large, the power doesn't doesn't mean it mean anything. You have you have statistical significance. When they're, when they're very small differences. But sometimes uh, the differences are much larger. So if you look at three vessel disease, 32.1 in the PCI group, 80 in, in, in the cabbage group. And again, it gets corrected by IPW. Now you may say, I don't believe that. Those differences are so great, represent such difference in, 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 in your groups that I don't believe that this kind of correction uh, works. And so that's a reason for using us other statistical approaches as well, as I'll show you. So here are the data, the unadjusted data and the adjusted data on, on the right using IPW, and there's really not that much difference after, after <coughs> the adjustment that's uh, interesting. And they go, uh, so two different, two different scales allows us to blow up the, uh, the differences. And if you look here, that's sort of the most sensitive one we go over here, you find initially you have higher mortality with with uh, cabbage than with a uh, PCI. Cabbage is in red, and PCI uh, is, is is in green. And initially you have a initial loss with with cabbage. And at one year there's no difference, but then you have increasing difference over time. So that uh, by by uh, four years uh, there's a significant uh, difference between them. With the mortality uh, uh, with of cabbage of 16.4 percent and PCI of uh, 20.8. 8%. So you can believe it? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, that's how it fits in with uh, other data, and I'll show you that in just a, in just a second. We also did a uh, matched analysis. If you don't like IPW, um, you can also do a matched. So what happens in the match, here's the unadjusted, and that's the same as you saw before for the baseline data, and here it is uh, using match. So here it comes out with the same numbers, 43,000. In, in both groups, 
And again, you, you find uh, no, no uh, a very little difference between the two groups after they're corrected. And here we have on top of each other all of the different approaches, all the different survival uh, me methods, and it made no, di no difference. Initially, you have that broad drop off of cabbage at one year, there's no difference in mortality between the groups. And at four years, there's a mortality ad ad advantage with cabbage compared to, to uh, BCL. We also looked at all, all of the, um, uh, the, the subgroups. Now, when we set this up, we were sure, we were just absolutely sure that we we're going to define those subgroups in which there'd be a, an advantage to PCI and those subgroups in which there'd be an advantage to cabbage. Didn't happen. Turned out that all subgroups examined was a mortality advantage uh, to uh, 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 PCI. Um, a couple of interesting uh, things here. In particular, I'd ask you to look at, at diabetes. This group here in blue. Now, in, di in, in patients with diabetes, randomized trials have fairly consistently shown a, a survival advantage to cabbage compared to PCI and multi-vessel uh, disease. And uh, while we did, we found a survival advantage overall, you can see that there's a much greater survival advantage in insulin-dependent uh, pa uh, patients with diabetes compared to patients with, with uh, out, out diabetes. So it sort of directionally was consistent with, with uh, the randomized trial data. Now, uh, could there be a um, a confounder that, that uh, explains the differences uh, between our, 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 our groups. So this is another very important kind of analysis that should be done in uh, comparative uh, effectiveness to see if you can come up with, uh, with a, a confounder that would explain the differences uh, between two, two groups. And so a confounder, what does a, con what does a confounder do? A confounder predicts outcome and has to have different prevalence in your groups under, un, under comparison. The different prevalence of a confounder between <clears throat> um, PCI and cabbage that would predict outcome and then account for the differences between groups. Is there a potential confounder like that? Well, there's been a lot of interest in one in particular, and that's frailty. So could there be a difference in prevalence between frailty? We avoid doing cabbage in patients that are frail and, and tend to do more of them in patients, uh, tend to do more PCI in, in, in frail patients. And could that explain the differences that, that we're seeing? Now, it doesn't have to be one confounder. It could also be a composite. It could be a set of things. But if we just use frailty as a as consideration, could, could that happen? Suppose you had an incidence of, 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 of uh, frailty of, <clears throat> of um, 30% in uh, the, the, uh, the PCI group but only 10% in the cabbage group. Then you start off here with PCI at 30 and go up to the green line, and then from there go over to the x-axis. So uh, if, if there was a three times difference in the prevalence of frailty between the groups, 10 and 30, you'd only need a hazard ratio for frailty of about 2.4 to explain the mortality differences between the groups. Could that happen? Well, you know, that really happened. So, so those who really love the study and said this is definitive results said you'd never find a you'd never find a confounder that that powerful. And those who hated the results of a certain said I don't believe it said see we told you you could you could find a, a, a covariate that could explain it. So we decided. We also looked at at composite uh, uh, outcomes um, <clears throat> of uh, death uh, death MI and um, and stroke. And uh, uh, essentially mimic the results. I'm not going to take you through that one in, in, in detail. Okay. So all observational studies can have treatment selection bias. We can approach but not fully resolve uh, resolve this with our statistical approaches. We may, may not have all the data that that uh, we want. We did miss some some data on GFR. Uh, and EF in particular, and that's really important. Remember, I started at the beginning in observational studies, having the covariate data available is much more important than it is in uh, randomized trials. Search limited to patients over 65 that would be linked to uh, med Medicare. And uh, um, it actually fits in, the search fits in very well with, uh, with other data in the literature. Here's data from the New York uh, State, uh, State database. Uh, um, here we look at uh, three vessel disease on the left, two vessel disease on the right, with its survival on the top, and, and freedom for death or MI on the bottom. 
and, and in, in all of these, you can see that there's a, an advantage to cabbage compared to uh, uh, PCI. But the same problem could apply. That is, that you may have a covariate that explains it. So if you have a bias, and the same bias applies in another study, it doesn't help you at all to have another study. So how about randomized trial data? Here's a meta-analysis of, of uh, 10, 10 randomized trials that Mark Lackey um, uh, published, looking at uh, uh, death or MI on the right and mortality on, on the left. You see that there is a trend for mortality advantage with, with uh, cabbage. Just here, the capital marker is going the other way. They're increasing rather than going down. And you see that there's a mortality advantage with cabbage compared to PCI. There's a trend of, of, of great interest. There's an interaction. So there's a difference in the, in the mortality advantage depending on age. Over the age of 65, which is the assert population, uh, that's where there's actually uh, a mortality advantage to cabbage. So actually, the randomized trial, trial data uh, and the observational data are really, uh, are really quite consistent. So it's interesting, you know, that's different than Pam Douglas observed in comparing drug eluting and bare metal stents. That would be a whole subject discussion of why I, I think that is. For reasons to, to think that that's um, uh, uh, consistent. So here's a, um, uh, a, a uh, meta-analysis, a more recent meta-analysis comparing uh, cabbage and, and uh, uh, PCI, again, showing it and advantage uh, to uh, Cabbage, and then here's here's uh, the data on myocardial infarction, which also fa favors um, uh, cabbage. Stroke goes the other way, and a certain found exactly the same thing as well. Uh, and so here's uh, so here's some study on on uh, uh, the, the, the same subject. I'm not going to take it, you you through it in, in uh, detail, but essentially it's also all, also uh, consistent. Frankly, this is a better study than the other one, but they, they, they beat us by a week to the journal. Yeah, yeah. the, the editor told me that ours is a better study, but we're going to take the other one anyway. What can you do? Anyway. So, survival similar to two arms at uh, one, one year. Survival is better than the, the caps and PCI at four years, consistent across subgroups, consistent with clinical trial and, and uh, uh, observational um, studies. It allows us, I think, in these patients, to actually make a causal uh, in influence considering all of the, uh, the, the, the data that, that there is a, a mortality advantage in most patients with multi vessel disease long term with cabbage compared to uh, P PCI. Uh, I certainly showed us how to, how, how to do it, but, but we've only seen part of it. I'm just going to very briefly take you through the economic data. I suspect that Zugule did this, but this is more for overview than for understanding all, all, of, all of the uh, uh, methods because. Uh, um, remember, what we're really interested in is not clinical low. We're interested in, in the value of role. Where do we work? Value uh, Institute. As all, I think you all now know, Zugwe's study has been accepted by a journal of the American College of Cardiology. One of the hardest things to do in doing uh, <clears throat> cost effectiveness analysis, I could make a case this is actually the hardest part is determining long-term survival, determining survival after the study, study period. I don't think there's a good way of, uh, of, of, uh, of doing it. Um, Zugwe has made himself an, an, an expert on uh, uh, the subject, um, but you know, sort of pick, pick your poison. It's extremely difficult uh, to do. And <clears throat> this is a problem that doesn't, that doesn't get solved, by the way, with randomized trials. Randomized trials, if you have an observation of five years, you've got a lot of, a lot of data. You still got to you got to create some kind of model somehow to predict survival long term if you really want to do cost effectiveness. So we looked at the influence of stroke my, myocardial on survival, and of course we looked at mortality within the, within the trial, and then we used various approaches from framing in U.S. life tables to try and estimate what survival would be depending on uh, age and, and uh, gender and whether people had a, a, a previous uh, event. And from that, you can get to um, uh, life years lost or, or um, uh, uh, gain. So if we look at it at a life, lifetime, the quality of gain, quality just a life year, years gain with uh, cabbage is uh, 0.18. Now you hear people say, boy, you know, if you give that very expensive cabbage cancer drug, you only gain four months of, of, of life. And I kind of listen to that because most of the things that, that, that we do, you have, you have 
uh, a, a relatively small amount of, uh, of, of gain. Or if you give a cancer drug uh, and you gain two months of life, it costs four hundred thousand thousand dollars for for a, 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 a life year that would be two point four million dollars. It starts to be a, a lot of money. So the small gain is not the important part. You do a couple of things. One is, do some people gain a lot? Some people gain nothing. Some people gain a lot. Uh, also, is it, is it cost effective? So you really need to tie uh, the cost and uh, and the clinical outcomes uh, together. So we went through a, a very complicated process, and Zubay really, really led the effort on, on this to look at, at um, uh, uh, costing, in which we had to take our hospitalizations, assign them a DRG, and then come up with costings. <clears throat> Um, uh, based on the pr perspective of our uh, payment system from, from uh, uh, Medicare. It's a very complicated uh, uh, pro process. And then on top of that, make estimates of physician costs as well, another complicated uh, uh, process which we're not going to take into really in uh, deep detail. And then you still only have the cost within the trial period. After that, you want to try and estimate what the costs are going to be lifetime. So uh, in this study, we used 2004 as our, as our base year data. And uh, for capital <laughs> Medicare expenditures, fifty-two hundred dollars. Now you may say, I don't believe that at all. These patients may veer from that significantly. So that's another problem that you don't have a perfect way of estimating costs beyond the, the observation uh, uh, period. Another very important thing in cost-effectiveness analysis is, is to discount, and the discount rate most people would say should be the same uh, between for clinical and economic outcomes. So why do you want to do that? Why do you want to discount? And the idea is, pre is to bring everything to present value. So you're going to value things in the future less than you are now. So if, if I was going to charge you five, five, five dollars, would you rather uh, pay me now or pay me in, 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 in one year? Would you rather pay me in one year or in 10 years? Would you rather pay me in 10 years? You discount the, uh, that, that five dollars. So that's the principle of, of, uh, of, di of discounting. Well, this is a U.S. study, so this is restricted to the U.S. Well, I'm um, answer that. Actually. So nice, uh, which is a British one. Uh, most of those three five, and usually they use two five percent. Yeah, three is very, 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 very common. Um, you'll you'll see debate about uh, about that. The other thing is, once you do a sensitivity analysis around your, uh, around your discount rate, um, and, and then you can have endless debate about whether uh, 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 in international studies you use the same discount rate everywhere. But some people believe that in another country you should use a dis different discount rate. <clears throat> I mean, once you get into international studies, it's a, that's a whole other extremely complicated um, uh, sub subject. So that gives you the basis for, for uh, uh, doing the cost effectiveness analysis. You know, so, so how does cabbage compare to uh, uh, PCI? Remember, you have a mortality advantage uh, at 30 days to, to PCI compared to, to, uh, to cabbage, and cabbage is still more expensive. So, so cabbage is then dominated by uh, PCI at, at 30 days. But what happens lifetime? What lifetime? Uh, you never make up the initial cost of of of, of cabbage. It's just more expensive. Uh, but, uh, but you gain in quality adjusted life years, uh, and so you end up with, with an uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratio of $50,000 per quality adjusted life, life year. Um, and here, uh, here we plot it. Um, so this is the cost effectiveness plane <clears throat> with which you look at um, uh, clinical efficacy on the x axis and incremental cost on, on the y axis, and everything is in the first quadrant. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's better outcomes at, at, at higher cost. And this will also be expressed in a cost-effectiveness acceptability curve. So whatever you believe the willingness to pay threshold is, if you believe it's $20,000, um, the probability of cabbage being cost-effective is going to be essentially zero. But if you believe it's $80,000, there's a very high probability that cabbage is going to be uh, uh, cost effective. This is essentially the same data that's in the cost effectiveness plane. It's just displayed in, in, in a different way. And on top of this, we did 
uh, probabilistic sensitivity and, uh, and, uh, analysis. And Zuko has really become an expert also on a couple of different kinds of things. One, the kind of costing we do to the estimation of, of, of life years. Um, <clears throat> three, uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, probabilistic um, uh, uh, sensitivity analysis, and four, the application of inverse probability weighting to this kind of study. And I believe that this paper will be the first in the literature that essentially has all of those things, especially the, uh, the inverse prob prob probability uh, uh, weighting. So if you wonder if we can push the methodologic boundaries, we can push the methodologic uh, boundaries. When you do uh, uh, sensitivity analysis, you have to you have to pick ranges for, for variables that seem reasonable based on the literature. And so these are the ranges that are that are used. Uh, and then you en end up with something like this. Now you look at this and say, oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do with this? But this is actually quite interpretable. The this still is in the in the uh, uh, cost effectiveness plane with the differences in quality adjusted life years on the x-axis. The difference in cost on, on the y axis. And you see, compared to the first one I showed you, where all the dots seem together, these display out a lot, uh, a lot more. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and then these, these uh, flying sources here uh, give you your, your, your lines of, of, of uh, un uncertainty. And so <clears throat> the higher your, your, not, your, your confidence interval going from 50 to, to, to 95, uh, you, you include more, more and more uh, patients. This is really very believable. This is believable for the difference in efficacy, the distribution, the difference in efficacy, and the difference in, in cost. But this is this is as fine an analysis of this type as you, as you could possibly uh, hope for. So, all right. So then, in conclusion. Uh, uh, it, and less than one year cap is more costly, less effective in the long run. Longer than one year cap is offered. Uh, lower quality, just a lot life years, but at high, higher cost. Using uh, uh, thresholds that are that are often used. Remember, such thresholds are not scientific numbers. They're, they're numbers that that, uh, are, that may or may not be agreed to by, by society. But almost any reasonable numbers, cabbage turns out to be uh, cost effective compared to uh, uh, PCI. So then, what can we say o overall? Observational studies provide real-world outcomes, greater generalizability of the randomized trials. Um, we can get the both best of both worlds by linking clinical uh, uh, databases and administrative databases, allowing us to look at very large samples from tremendous power. Uh, uh, administrative da databases supplement clinical data as well by allowing us to look at resources and uh, 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 cost data. So we can do both clinical and comparative effectiveness uh, um, studies. Nonetheless, we still have the big problem of observational studies remains uh, treatment uh, selection bias. But clearly, I think both randomized trials and observational uh, studies have uh, critical roles to, to play. And what I can say about us is we're capable of any of this. These are complicated analyses you're going to find, and we're absolutely capable of doing any of them right here. Thanks very much. Jenny. If you, yes. Yes. That's why. That's why many people believe that you should use inverse probability weighting rather than than, than match. And you'll notice that we we lost actually the majority of our patients by using a, a matched approach. But it's good to do it both ways. We're doing uh, cost effectiveness on on analysis like this. How are you going to do inverse matching on the cost as well? Um, or just like uh, or not? Just like using the so let's look away. What do you think about propensity propensity matching on the on, on the costs? I don't know what to make out of that. That's an interesting question. Propensity matching on on the costs. You really you, you remember you were doing propensity matching on is is covariance. You're not matching. You're not doing it on outcome. Cost is really. I, I can't hear you. So you, you can, and people do. So meta analyses, you see meta analyses on observational studies as well as meta analyses on, on randomized trials.
So, so, and people do do that. People do do that. But if you look at the total number of patients that have been ran, randomized uh, in, uh, in the strategy of PCI versus cabbage ever, um, it's only like 20,000 uh, patients. So you still run out of data. And if you look at more contemporary d data, looking at drug eluting stents versus, versus cabbage, it's a tiny amount of data. 5,000. <laughs> Right. So we did the same. We did the same thing on the cost-effectiveness analysis of using both IPW and, and, and match. So if you can do, you know, the people that that, that there are people that can only do the the, the, the clinical propensity uh, studies and analytically, but if you can do the cost-effectiveness, you got to do the clinical first. You can do the cost effectiveness, you really can do any of it. Okay.